So it's all out here. Um, so we shall begin. Um, first and foremost, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to extend our warmest welcome to the guests of honor, uh, members of the panel, the audience on Facebook Live as well as YouTube Live. We are streaming both on Facebook as well as YouTube from Malaysia, from Thailand, from the States. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to have all of you here on this occasion today. So uh, we have with us today Ms. Catherine Job, uh, the Cultural Affairs Officer um, at the U.S. Embassy Kuala Lumpur, uh, Professor Dr. Nip Mahiran Nip Muhammad, the Principal Investigator of the Preservation of the Rabana Kerching of Kampung Laut Project, who is also the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academic and International uh, University of Malaysia, Kelantan. Uh, we have with us Professor Dr. William Ryan Chapman, uh, the Dean of the School of Architecture, University of Hawaii at Manoa. And we also have Dr. Erin Lackey, AAAS Science and Technology Fellow, uh, Foreign Affairs Officer at the Cultural Heritage Center, uh, US Department of State. We have Professor Dr. Farouk Zakaria uh, the, from the Department of Islamic Economics and Management, Prince, uh, Faculty of Islamic uh, Science, uh, Prince of Songkla University, Thailand. Uh, so welcome to the webinar on preserving performing arts, the best practice. And for your information, this webinar is one of the projects organized by the members of the preservation of the Rabana Kerching of Kampung Laut project, which is a uh, preservation project of the Rabana Kerching Performing Art uh, that is funded by the Ambassador's Fund for Cultural Preservation, uh, or in short, it is called as AFCP. And this webinar is planned to be a platform to discuss ideas uh, to preserve heritage or traditional properties performing art, hence uh, conserving the identity of identity of the local uh, community. Um, so in this session, we will uh, have, um, in between the webinar, we will have a quiz session, and there will also be the Q&A session from the audience from the uh, live streaming. So I guess to begin with, let us first um, watch uh, the opening video uh, which is a poem on Rabana Kerching by uh, Professor Dr. Faru Zakaria. I came here to this Kampung Laut village to see what I have to trace. Here, culture I embrace, woven like a lace. I found Rabana Kerching almost forgotten in existence he is experiencing a beautiful gem of those loving but Harun the activist is still surviving with his circle of Rabana Kerching living a treasure almost forgotten sound of the past hidden this gem is still strong in this temple, a tempering light instrument with metal flap at the side adornment, singing, dancing while hitting the flat leather surface percussion, its chanting rhyme is merely about religion. To those who are still trying to revive its well-being, UMK and U.S. Embassy, together with the activists in reigning, I thank you for all the good deeds you are engaging. I'm still sitting here smiling from this Thai sea I kept reminiscing. Those were the days of Rabana Kache. In my mind, I'm singing.
Thanks, uh, Prof. Faro, for the uh, wonderful poem. Prof. Faro is a staunch, a staunch activist of, uh, of uh, Malay performing arts. And for those who are into Rabana Kaching, the poem is indeed uh, touching. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to first invite Ms. Catherine Job, from, uh, the Cultural Affairs Officer from the U.S. Uh, Embassy of Kuala Lumpur, uh, to give he, her welcoming remarks. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much for that warm welcome and also agree that there was a beautiful uh, poem and video introducing us all to Rabana Kerching. Good morning, everyone. Salamat pagi samwa. My name is Catherine Jope and I'm the cultural affairs officer at the US Embassy in Kuala Lumpur. I'm really delighted to be here and to be a part of this important forum entitled Preserving Performance Arts best practices with our distinguished panel of experts. This forum is in conjunction with the U.S. Department of State's Ambassadors Fund for Cultural Preservation Award. Our current project with UMK is the 12th time that Malaysia has been awarded this prestigious grant since 2001. And of those 12 awards, partners in the state of Kelantan have received the most in all of Malaysia. The U.S. Embassy is delighted to partner with the University of Malaysia Kelantan in this cultural preservation project, Rubana Kerching of Kampung Laut, which was awarded during the 20th anniversary year of the Ambassadors Fund for Cultural Preservation. On behalf of the U.S. Embassy, I would like to thank Professor Dr. Nick Maharan, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academic and International Affairs at University of Malaysia Kelantan, and the project lead, Dr. Angie, for their hard work and dedication to make this project a success. For today's forum, I would to let, like to express our sincere gratitude to our esteemed panelists sharing their expertise with us today. From the United States, we have Professor William Chapman from the University of Hawaii and Dr. Aaron Leckie from the Cultural Heritage Center at the U.S. Department of State. We also have Malaysian academic and poet laureate, Professor Farouk Zaria from Prince Songkhla University in Thailand. Thank you to all of you for sharing again your expertise. We also would like to thank our moderator, Dr. Afik. Thank you so much for joining us again. I fondly remember my first visit to Kelantan this past January to launch this project along with our ambassador, uh, Ambassador McFeeders along with our partners as well from UMK. And I'm really delighted at the amount of progress that we've been all, all been able to make over the past few months and the meticulous research that has been done so far. Again, allow me to congratulate the entire team and the people of Kampung Laut who are willing to share their ceremonial performance art with the world. I look forward to attending the closing ceremony in November and again, seeing all of you there to celebrate this important milestone. Terima kasih, semua dan jumpa lagi. Thank you very much, Mi uh, Job, for uh, the remarks. Uh, thanks for spending your time with us today to give the welcoming remarks. Um, so UMK and the team of the preservation of the Rana Ching of Kampong Laut is indeed grateful to the U.S. Embassy for the funding. And the same goes to the people of uh, Kampong Laut, uh, who is directly involved in the uh, Rana Ching performing arts. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, next let us hear the welcoming remarks from Professor Dr. Nip Mahiran Nip Muhammad. Uh, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academic and International, uh, UMK, who is also the principal investigator of the preservation of the Rabana Kerching of Kampung Laut project. Welcome, Prof. Afik, um, as the Masters of Ceremony today, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and um, good afternoon to Prof Chapman, um, and as well as um, good evening to uh, Dr. Erin. I think we have differences in terms of time from Malaysia. Uh, in fact, Hawaii and, and also um, in, in US. Um, our Honorable Miss uh, Catherine Diop, Cultural Affairs Officers at US Embassy Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Members of panelists, Professor Dr. William Ryan Chapman, Dean of School of Architecture, University of Hawaii at Manoa. 
Dr. Erin Lackey, American Association for Advancement of Science, Technology and Policy Fellow, Foreign Affairs Officers, Cultural Heritage Center, U.S. Department of State. Prof. Dr. Farouk Zakaria, our uh, UMK uh, professors, our former UMK professors, and currently at the Department of Islamic Economics and Management, Faculty of Islamic Science, Prince of Songkhla University. Thank you, everyone. Um, and also thank you um, for able to make your time today. And I can understand that, you know, through your busy time, you are still able to commit yourself to our webinar today. So first of all, I would like to thank you, U.S. government and the AFCP or Ambassador Fund for Cultural Preservation for Trusted UMK to undertake this project entitled uh, Preserving Rebana Kerching of Kampung Laut. And of course, I would like to very much appreciate and thank you to Mr. Riaz for giving this opportunity for me and my team to uh, uh, prepare a proposal since 2014. Actually, we have uh, the trying uh, to highlight this Rebana Kerching and Alhamdulillah, we are able to make it in 2021. So this project uh, began since October 2021 and will end by November 2022 where uh, the closing ceremony and also we are going to show the performance through the training that have been done by our groups uh, from the schools uh, uh, in Kapolau as well as um, from the Kotobaru uh, Secondary School. So uh, closing ceremony will show uh, the real performance um, as well as um, uh, a little bit of modernization uh, that they may uh, show to cater um, the young generations of this um, heritage and culture. And under this project, the deliverables will be the research output. And I was informed that the research has been completed and they are ready uh, to compile and publish. And also we are preparing uh, with all the documents and pictures uh, uh, and um, produce coffee table book and uh, probably uh, somewhere in October, no, sorry, in August, we're going to have documentary of Rabana Kerching uh, by Malaysian National TV, which is TV1. And also um, uh, the deliverables of this project is also a co-curriculum modules for university and uh, secondary school students. Uh, so we are now in the process of training for trainers and from there we are going to establish or develop uh, modules so that the clubs or the association will be formed in the university, not just UMK, but also at other universities uh, that will be part of our collaborators later on. So today is actually Mark and collaboration with University of Hawaii in Manoa, particularly with uh, Professor Chapman. Thank you, Prof, for accepting my invitation to work on this project. And I'm sure not only Professor Chapman will be partly uh, contribute to this project, there, there will be a few more activists in cultural preservation in University of Hawaii, which is known as highly uh, uh, contributed to this preservation in Southeast Asia and other state of the world uh, into this kind of uh, project. So uh, probably after this, we may have a few more collaborators from the university and MOU will be signed with the university, inshallah. And uh, thank you also, Prof. Chapman, uh, for agreeing uh, in, to, to collaborate with us uh, and assist us on this project. And I would also like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Erin Lackey to be able to make uh, your time for the uh, webinar today. And I know that you are very busy. Uh, definitely, I wish that um, I will meet you or invite you to Malaysia. And I heard that Prof. William will be coming to Malaysia in uh, June. And I, and I guess uh, from there, there will be another webinar, uh, you know, on physical terms with uh, Prof. Chapman later on. And we are going to invite other universities also uh, for that particular event. Um, uh, so I guess uh, that's, just, that's, that's all from me. Um, just a little bit about uh, the objective of this uh, webinar is that we want to um, uh, make sure that we are able to educate and train the younger generation in Rabana Kerching and make them to understand um, our heritage and our traditional uh, performing. So I hope that uh, this webinar will give a fruitful um, uh, knowledge and um, 
experience to all the uh, participants for this webinar. And with that, again, I wish all of you have a fruitful webinar. Thank you. And thank you again to all the panelists and also to the U.S. Embassy. So back to you, Afik. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Nid Mahiran, Nid Muhammad, um, for the remarks. And indeed, we are hoping for this project to have a successful outcome for the uh, benefits of the future generation so that they will be able to uh, still observe the Rabana Kaching performing art. Um, so I guess we shall now proceed to our main agenda for today, which is the webinar session. And right now from the UK team, we are live streaming from the American corner in the library of uh, University of Malaysia, Kelantan. So in the library, we have a, a corner that is called as American corner. Um, so for the webinar session, um, I'll be moderating the webinar session and uh, perhaps I'll be using uh, Manglish, which is uh, uh, Malaysian English, because I'm not that well versed with uh, American English, though I watch a lot of Hollywood movies. Um, we have uh, three panelists with us uh, in live streaming, uh, which is uh, Professor Dr. William Ryan Chapman, in which I will address him as Professor Chapman um, throughout the webinar. Uh, for the Dean of the School of Architecture from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And then we have Dr. Erin Lackey, uh, American Association of uh, Advancements of Science, uh, Technology and Policy Fellow, Foreign Affairs Officer from uh, the Cultural Heritage Center, uh, U.S. Department of State. And we also have uh, Professor Dr. Farouk Zakaria from the Department of Islamic Economics and Management, uh, Faculty of Islamic Science, uh, Prince of Songkla University uh, from Thailand. So uh, these are the three panelists that uh, will share with us their insights on um, heritage preservation. And these three panelists, they come from an extensive background of expertise. And we gather them today so that we can learn something new about preserve, uh, preservation and preserving heritage. Uh, Professor Dr. Uh, William Ryan Chapman, Prof. Chapman, for example, comes from a background of architecture and archaeology. And Dr. Erin Lackey uh, has a background in earth and life sciences and has been working as an officer at the Cultural Heritage Center at the uh, Department of State and has been doing projects uh, involving the intersection of climate and heritage. And we have Professor Dr. Farouk Zakaria. Prof. Farouk comes from an extensive background of Malay performing arts, especially the Mayong performing art. So these three panelists, they come from a, a different background of expertise, and we are here to uh, listen to them for a sharing session throughout the webinar on the insight that they could uh, provide us on the best uh, way to practice, uh, to preserve heritage, uh, be uh, performing arts or uh, other types of heritage based on their areas of expertise. So to begin with, uh, perhaps I am going to invite uh, each panelist to share with us what they have been working on uh, based on their area of expertise. So we could hear directly from them and perhaps I'll call upon uh, Prof Chapman first. Uh, could you comment in like uh, perhaps seven to 10 minutes uh, what uh, you have been working on based on your area of expertise? I believe you have uh, provided us your slides as well in which the secretariat will uh, run the slides for you. So uh, you're welcome, Prof. Thank you so much, and I'm really pleased to be part of this whole endeavor, which I think is very ambitious and really nicely put together. So if we could just start with my first slide, please. I'll try to keep it to seven minutes. Um, um, Professor Nurel? Okay, good. So I'm going to talk a little bit about intangible heritage, which is really where the kind of work that you're promoting is situated. Um, I come, as, as you noted, a, from an architectural background, so I was trained as an architectural conservator, but I've been very aware that things have been changing. Next, please. So some of my work involved working in Angkor in the early 1990s when it was first being reopened, and our concerns were really the return of the physical character of the site. Next, please. <coughs> Thank you. 
And I also had a chance to work a great deal in Thailand with the fine arts department. And we had, a, the, you know, many of the issues of things like, should you in fact um, <clears throat> repaint and bring things back to their original character or should you try to keep them as a, as a evolved site? Next, please. <clears throat> I also had an opportunity to work on a fu Rockefeller funded project to look at the everyday architecture of Cambodia, which was architecture, but in a sense, very ephemeral too. Next, please. And whoops, went too far. So on, but on some of the, but I've also had a chance quite a bit to work in Micronesia because we have a, um, a U.S. agreement with the Federated States of Micronesia. Nam Madal is a massive site in down to Panape in the Federated States of Micronesia. And next, now next, and also with Palau, um, in which um, aspects of the past have been kept alive through practice, which really fringes upon um, intangible culture. Next, please. <clears throat> and one of the things we found when we were doing our different work, whether it was looking at places like Nam Madal or looking at the fortifications built during World War II, was that we often found that the local historic preservation organization was much more interested in their intangible culture. Next, please. So this is a good example from Kosterai, where they've spent a great deal of time taping and also recording in different ways, um, things like the girls' puberty rights ceremonies and things of that kind, which they continued to tell us were more important to them than the sites of World War II. Next, please. <clears throat> so we're walking, working in the background, and I'm trying to give you a little context for this of the UNESCO Convention on Intangible Culture from 2003, which was really a kind of a worldwide recognition that sites and buildings were not the only thing worth preserving. Next, please. Um, the American tradition, and I sort of feel it's important that you understand some of what American historic preservation does, since this is coming through the Ambassadors Fund, was traditionally, just as in Europe and in parts of Asia, focused on, on sites such as George Washington South and Mount Vernon. Next, please. And it then extended to houses in more everyday use, not necessarily museums. Next, please. And what I was particularly, no, you're right. Next, please. So what I was particularly interested in was the way historic preservation could serve as a development tool, particularly for um, small towns and small and cities that had experienced um, economic uh, decline and, um, and uh, retail abandonment in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. And this was part of a major effort to revitalize our towns. So I saw pre preservation in this light. Next, please. But there was always an issue of uh, if you had an area, say, that was predominantly Chinese and its history was Chinese and tangibility was part of that understanding. Next, please. <laughs> so I did a paper recently for the Journal of Heritage, Intangible Heritage, and it was a kind of overview of heritage conservation in America, the intangible side. And some of it began with the Library of Congress back in the 1930s. Next, please. <clears throat> and Alan Lomax is quite a famous figure. He was a a musician himself, and he was a historian of music. And he went all over the country recording um, songs that were rapidly being lost. Next, please. Um, later, Alan Jabbar would take over as the head of the American Folklife Center, which would continue the work of recording um, American um, cultural contributions, whether it's music or whether it was basketry or other other sorts of crafts and ways of doing things that were on the verge of being lost. Next, please. And uh, in 1967, the Smithsonian started the Folklife Festival, which really was a celebration of folk, um, of um, intangible heritage. Um, each year, they would focus on different parts of either the United States or other cultures, and particularly cultures that touched upon the United States, like places in the Caribbean, places in Canada, and, and, uh, and to some degree, eventually, places in Asia. Next, please. 
And in 1982, the National Endowment for the Arts began the National Heritage Fellowship Program, in which individual practitioners of traditional music or other sorts of art forms would be recognized and partially supported. Next, please. <clears throat> um, the National Park Service, with which I've worked quite a lot, um, got into this also in the 1990s. Um, they published something called Traditional Cultural Properties and something else on documenting traditional cop properties. And this was a recognition that um, particularly native peoples often didn't see significance in the same way that outsiders saw significance. Next, please. And so traditional practices that might have been almost overlooked, like this is rice gathering in Minnesota by native people there, had been had continued as a tradition and practice that needed to be recognized. Next, please. And in 1990, there was the beginnings of the Tribal Preservation Program, which recognized knowledgeable members of American and Native American tribes, and also the, 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 the beliefs, traditions, and practices of those tribes. Next, please. <clears throat> and the National Park Service began in the 1980s a um, Pacific Islands program focused particularly on Micronesia, though in this case also on Samoa, and I was um, fortunate enough from 1993 to around 2001 to be involved in annual training and annual reporting efforts being done in those countries. Next, please. So now in a place like Hawaii, intangible culture has much more meaning, I think, to Native people than other kinds of culture because it's something that they see as coming, coming from the heart of their culture. So we've had a great revival of Hula, Halau in Hawaii, but also a revival of traditional crafts, language, and other, other things associated with pre-contact Hawaii. Next, please. And I think this is um, a, a kind of trend that's become more and more important. And many countries recognize that um, their traditional culture, whether it's dance or whether it's music or other forms of intangible culture, that these uh, are probably among the things that people in general cherish the most. Next, please. And that would include in, say, Indonesia, something like a gamelan orchestra. Next, please. Or particularly traditional cuisine, which many people see as the heart of their heritage or maybe the belly of their heritage. So I think um, um, you're on the right track. This project is very much on the right track and focusing on a, a very important tradition of music and dance and performance that without these kinds of efforts would be lost. So those are my comments and my slideshow. So I'm happy to take questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof Chapman, for the sharing. Uh, it is indeed uh, great to note that uh, you have been working on different parts of the world and you have been working on both uh, tangible and intangible heritage as well. And it is an extensive work uh, experience on intangible uh, heritage on your part. So thank you very much, Prof. Uh, next, uh, we will um, invite uh, Dr. Erin Lecky uh, from the Department of State uh, to share with us about what she's doing and her area of expertise. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to my colleagues at UMK for organizing this wonderful session and uh, for the embassy uh, in Kuala Lumpur for, uh, for bringing all of these uh, great folks together. Um, so let's see if I can get my slides, please. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Erin Leckie and I'm from the part of the US government, uh, one part of the US government that preserves and protects cultural heritage around the world. And uh, specifically, I am part of a team that administers the US Ambassadors Fund for Cultural Preservation, which is uh, monies that are specifically set aside for uh, preserving tangible and intangible heritage around the world. And, um, uh, and as you heard, we've just celebrated our 20th, we're actually in our 21st year of doing these projects. And we've done over a thousand projects 
uh, around the world. So uh, we're very uh, excited and proud of this work. Um, and because of my work with this fund, I wanted to be able to share some examples with you of, of some of the work that we've done to preserve um, intangible heritage and particularly performing arts. Um, next slide, please. So uh, I just feel the need to introduce myself a little bit. Um, so uh, I, I work virtually out of Washington, DC, but I live in Boulder, Colorado. Um, so I'm sort of in the middle of the United States. There's a picture of my town. We have mountains and a university and that's, that's about it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so even though I work in cultural heritage now, uh, my background is as a scientist. And um, so I've worked a lot in how climate change affects different kinds of communities, whether those are plant communities, animal communities, human communities. Um, and so this slide is of some of my favorite uh, field work. Those top two images are in Costa Rica in different kinds of forests there. Um, I've also worked a lot with fossils, which is the, the image on the left, um, plant and insect communities from millions of years ago. Um, but my favorite kinds of work, I think, are those last two slides in the bottom right, um, which is a project about uh, working with communities and particularly with kids to understand the impacts of climate change on their lives and the places where they live. Next slide, please. So, uh, but now, as I say, I work um, just with human communities and uh, specifically around preserving their cultural heritage as part of the US Department of State's Cultural Heritage Center. And one of the reasons that I love this work so much is because it gives me a chance to work with communities around the world to preserve the things that are important to them. And then I get to learn about them. So whether that's um, you know, physical structures in Peru or Egypt, um, or uh, learning about different traditions, like this picture of the ambassador learning a traditional weaving in Thailand. Um, I just, I, I love um, all of these ways of interacting um, with, with different people and uh, making an impact. Next slide, please. So um, why is it important for, uh, for a government to show respect for the cultures uh, in other parts of the world? Um, well, for one, I, it's critical because it, it builds that level of respect, right? These, uh, I know this, this is a fairly obvious thing, but um, I don't think you can ever have too much of demonstrating respect for other people. Um, and when you show respect for other people's culture, that creates a bond uh, upon which uh, other kinds of friendships can, can be built. Um, it also supports communities in being able to care for their own culture, which almost every community wants to do. Um, when cultural heritage is threatened, it's rarely because people just don't care about it. Um, and so um, it's, it's great to be able to um, to support that that work to get people the tools that they need to do uh, to do the work that's important to them. And finally, um, it recognizes that uh, cultural heritage isn't just something that happened in the past. It's something that people live every day and that people are happiest when they are feeling connected to their communities and to their cultures. Um, actually, I'd like to skip my next slide because it basically says what I just said in a whole lot more words. <laughs> so we could just go to the next one there. Um, and I was so glad that Dr. Chapman spoke about a tangible and intangible heritage um, because that's a distinction that uh, in the past used to um, really get people very hung up. Um, you know, that, that as if a tangible and intangible heritage uh, were two very different things. Next slide. Tangible heritage, of course, being things you can touch, the preservation of buildings um, and sites and, uh, and objects as well, religious objects, craft objects. Um, and, uh, and partly these things all go together because when they're threatened, it's usually by destruction of some kind, some kind of physical um, damage to the objects. Next slide, please. Whereas intangible heritage traditions, the knowledge and the skills um, that a culture holds, those are threatened when they just fail to be passed on to the next generation, right? When people stop practicing them and stop thinking about them. And uh, of course, what, um, 
what almost everyone recognizes if they think about it, of course, is that these aren't really two different things. They're two things that go together, right? If you if you have objects that are sacred to you, there's probably also some kind of traditions and practices that go along with the use of those objects. They don't just sort of exist somewhere outside uh, in a special pocket of culture where no one interacts with them. That's, that's very rarely true. So um, I would like to show you some examples of ways that the Ambassadors Fund has uh, tried to help um, uh, to preserve um, both the intangible and, and tangible sides of, of cultural heritage. Next slide, please. So uh, one way that we've supported the performing arts in, in particular is through the preservation of the spaces where those performing arts happened. So um, this was a project in Dominica, which is a small island in the Caribbean that was damaged by a hurricane in 2017. And um, so we helped to rebuild this space that is not just for practicing and performing, but also has wood carving workshops um, and was a really vital part of the community. Next, please. This is a project that was done in Mali in Africa. And uh, this project really focused on the preservation of musical instruments from several different tribes in one region. Um, but it also, of course, documented how those instruments were used. And um, as you can see in the photo on the left, it was also um, discussion with those who use the instruments um, and also the, the leaders in the community about why those instruments are important. So trying to you know, capture not just the objects themselves, but their full cultural significance. Next, please. This was a great project in Uzbekistan. And, um, and this is a project that was really celebrating the life of a particular performer. And um, Tamara Kanum was uh, not just uh, just a, a, an amazing performer, but she was really groundbreaking in that she uh, she really put herself out there as a woman performer at a time when when that was when that was not really allowed, and she performed without a veil, which was actually quite dangerous for her. Um, and other performer, other female performers were killed for doing the same thing. So she was very courageous. And uh, in this project, we preserved um, lots of her um, costumes and jewelries and also some of the posters um, of her performances. Next, please. Um, so uh, as you heard too at the beginning, uh, we're very proud of, of, of all of the performing arts and intangible heritage projects. I think we've done seven so far in Malaysia. Um, and so we're very excited to be part of uh, preserving Rabana Kuching. And um, in this project here, uh, the preservation of the theatrical traditions of Bangsawan, um, we're not just preserving um, you know, the, the physical pieces that go into a performance, but this was also a documentation of the stories of the performers themselves and interviews with um, troops of performers about about why, um, why performing this was important to them. Next, please. And this is the last project I wanted to show you because um, I just love the, the imagery from this project um, and the documentation of the shadow play. And, um, and this project included uh, a, a full documentation of a 40, you know, the 40 day performance, um, and, and so that was you know, just from a technical standpoint was pretty impressive, but also this project was really about passing on this performance to the next generation and um, having workshops for kids. And they had uh, four young musicians who took part in the entire project as well. So next please. And uh, this is the most obvious slide in the world, and I want to apologize for that. But anytime I'm talking about something that's a problem, I like to leave my audience with some things um, that they can do about it. Um, and particularly for the younger people in the audience um, uh, who, who want to be you know, part of, of preserving um, their, their cultural heritage, obviously supporting and, and attending arts events and supporting artists in your community is important. And, to the extent that you're comfortable uh, learning um, and sharing uh, the art yourself, 
And that is fantastic. But I would say that one of the things that you can do that's that's maybe most revolutionary and maybe it doesn't seem revolutionary to you is to use the technology that you are so familiar with that uh, maybe elders in your family or your community are not familiar with, even you know, as simple as your phone, taking pictures, interviewing people, um, making videos, um, all of these things can help preserve and share uh, cultural traditions um, outside of your communities and keep them alive. So next slide, please. So that's it. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions, obviously, in the Q&A. Um, but if you have questions later, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Erin Lecky from the Department of State. So we will have the Q&A session later after the, the, uh, after the third part of the webinar. So this is basically the first part of the webinar where we have the uh, panelists to share what they are doing. And the second part will be, will be talking about uh, heritage. The, part, the third part will, have, uh, will be talking about uh, preservation. Um, and then we'll have the Q&A session. So thank you very much, Dr. Erin Lecky from the Department of State. It is indeed a... Um, um, a wonderful uh, sharing session in the sense that uh, when when you shared about um, about uh, the the impact of uh, climate change on uh, heritage, this uh, I think I I would say that it is something new in Malaysia. So not many people are thinking about it, and or perhaps it is something that is uh, going to uh, be important in the near future. But uh, so it is not that obvious in Malaysia, but something that you are doing is uh, very uh, remarkable. And what the Department of State have been doing as well, uh, helping uh, to preserve uh, thousands of uh, uh, heritage, tangible tangible around the world is uh, momentous, I would say. So um, uh, next, uh, let us have uh, Prof. Faro. Uh, from uh, Prince of Songkla University to share with us about uh, his areas of expertise, what he has been doing. Uh, welcome, Prof. Thank you very much, Mr. Afi. Uh, Salam alaikum and uh, sawadika from uh, Prince Songkla University, Thailand. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to specifically zero in into Rabana Kerching. But before I zero in into Rabana Kerching, I will just talk a little bit about uh, what is uh, heritage and so on. Can, can we start the PowerPoint, please? All right. So uh, I'm going to present more on Rabana Kerching of Kampong Laut, current and future uh, aspects of Rabana Kerching. Next. Uh, these are some of the examples of dying arts in Malaysia. Um, on the left, you can see the dance of Mak Yong, and then followed by DK Barat, which is not dying. And then is Tok Salampit, which is dying. Then Menorah, which is also dying in Kelantan. Uh, and then we have uh, Wayang Kulit, which is puppet show, uh, which is not dying. And then we have Mind Patri. Mind Patri is, another, is a form of spiritual healing in Kelantan, which is not dying, but still being practiced in Kelantan. Next. Um, heritage, uh, for us in Malaysia, is something that is um, passed from one generation to another generation. And like what other speakers have said, it's tangible and intangible. And not many people understand what is intangible. I think intangible here include culture, and also performing arts. Okay, next. So um, thanks to UMK and also US Embassy, who is very caring, who are very caring in uh, safeguarding our heritage. Uh, UMK, let, let me start with UMK. UMK is, a nine, is the 19th public university in Malaysia, and its, start, its inception is in 2007, and heritage study is part of uh, one of the faculties that was being formed in 2007 and heritage studies is very important in UMK and I guess this proves this research proves that UMK is very concerned with heritage. Next. And uh, I wrote a paper in 2014 about the Rabana Kerching of Kampung Laut. I wrote a case study of cultural community project to school pupils in Kelantan. Next. 
Now, Rabana Kerching is, uh, is a Malay performing arts. Uh, it comprises of singing, dancing, and also music. And it doesn't have any acting in it. And normally it is performed in the public, to the public for ceremonial purposes or for entertainment. And um, Rabana Kerching is basically the, the instrument used in the performance. The instrument is a tambourine light uh, instrument with metal flat at the side. Okay, next. Uh, there is no acting involved and the dancers is basically tied, 10 people and uh, the musical um, instrument is being played by 10, almost 10 people. Next. So the performance is sort of chanting and also singing of religious verses with music yeah and the lyrics are basically in arabic in persian as well as in local malay which is uh, i should say is irony that we do not really understand the the lyrics yeah and uh, it's originally from uh, the the i think it's originally from yemen next and of course it in, in, it, it incorporate uh, Islamic values as well as um, local values. And the costume worn during the performance is being influenced by, by the local culture as well as the Chinese culture. So if you have, if you have the chance to see the, the costume, the vest worn by the dancers, or we call it permaco, they have sometimes they have the animal motifs like butterflies as well as uh, dragon which is not common in Malay culture because Malay culture normally they do not have animal motif they only have floral motif or abstract motif but not animal motif but in this in this case of Rabana Kerching the vest carried a butterfly or a dragon motif which is very unique this is because I think the the con confluent of a traders from from the Middle East, from uh, China to that particular place, which is Kampung Lao, that has enhanced uh, the design of the vest of Rabana Kerching. Next. Uh, the current situation, well, Rabana Kerching is still surviving, but uh, surviving, but not really dynamic. But um, the action is being, is, is being done but however, it has not been uh, proven uh, expanding. Yeah? And we call it in Malay, sayang. Sayang means, oh, what a shame that the, the culture is, you know, dying, you know. So we thank you, UMK and also USA Embassy Malaysia for taking the, the incentive to preserve and uh, revive Rabana Kerching in Kampung Lao. Next. Now, this is my perception of the uh, dying arts. Factors contributing to dying, dying of most traditional performances in Malaysia is that number one is the aging activists. The activists are old and they are not able to play anymore, especially in um, specific uh, performing arts like Rabana Kerchik. Now, same goes to Mayong before. Mayong before used to be uh, sought in this position. Uh, whereby it's dying and it was revived by the younger generation. Now, a uh, declining number of activists no longer popular in the society because they are, they are more into modern arts, modern performing arts. Um, so we, we can expect them to appreciate when they don't even know the culture. Now, the number of viewers is, of course, less number of viewers and attractive performances, incomprehensible, they do not understand younger generation are not interested, not willing to pay. Uh, this, let us put aside this willingness to pay for the performance. In Malaysia, not many people are willing to pay for any performances. Now, uh, legal enforcement by the state government, which is not for Rabana Kerching, but for other, for other form of performing arts. Rabana Kerching is not being banned. Next. Uh, it's still surviving. Why it is still surviving? Because it is uh, run by the NGOs, I think by the associate, by the association in that particular village, the Association of Rabana Kerching of Kampung Laut, 
And because there is one person there, Pak Harun, his name is Pak Harun, and Pak Harun is the one that is always motivating his member to keep on doing it, regardless of whether there is uh, support or whatever. All right, next. And uh, the, the, the objective of the association is, of course, to keep on uh, doing it as long as we, they have members and disseminate information on Rabana Kerching as well as to inculcate appreciation among younger generation towards this form of arts. And of course, uh, they are doing some form of innovation to that, that uh, Rabana Kerching. All right, next. Uh, this was a research by me in 2014. Cikgu Azmi, who was the deputy chairman, is also very motivated. And they have incorporated students or pupils from the, the neighboring schools, which is Sekolah Kebangsaan Kampung, Lai, Kampung Laut, the primary school of Kampung Laut, to learn these uh, performances. But however, students, girls especially, are not allowed to perform after they are 12 years old. Because 12 years old is con considered as puberty period. And this is where in Islam, girls after 12 years old are not allowed to perform anymore. All right. So that's one of the one of the limitations for these performances. Only boys are allowed to play. Next. And uh, training schedule are being planned by the association and the school. And it is done during the evening. And um, it is like only two hours for every training from 5 to 7 p.m. Next. And uh, is the government also took part in um, trying to trying to make it more more uh, lively through the Tunas Budaya program. All right. Next. Uh, the modest operandi of Rabana Kerching Kampung Laut is to ensure its sustainability. And it is from the association to the school and to many other schools. And that, that's how the schools are the agent of change. And they are the one that disseminate the information to other schools. But ironically, it's only Kampung Laut Primary School that is taking up this, this Rubana Kriching performances. However, UMK has also done, it has also embarked on this project by having a co curriculum, uh, an official curriculum in UMK to to um, sort of uh, develop Rabana Kerching further. Okay, next. Current situation still surviving, but at the edge of dying, a hope came after UMK and USC Embassy embarked on this project. Next. Reviving Rabana Kerching, well, there are many ways of reviving it, and they, it might work or it might not work. But I think the number one, the most important one is to create awareness about the about Rabana Kerching and it's time consuming. And another way is to have more attractive performances, more attractive costumes, the dance must be appealing to and the standard of structure must be uh, according to sequence, according to a proper structure and not, not uh, you must be uniform, I would like to say. Now, cultivation of rabbinic kerching among the new generation, inheritances of uh, rabbinic kerching uh, by the new generation, uh, cascading the knowledge of rabbinic kerching to younger generation, uh, frequent performances, which is not frequent now, is far from frequent. Now, internet and social media promotions, we can use media to promote these arts and the state government has, must also promote apart from the federal government uh, in promoting Rabana Kerching. Next. And conclusion, I would like to say Rabana Kerching is now slowly revived by the support from uh, the effort of UMK and USA Embassy and uh, Pak Harun, a strong will advisor, come principal trainer, as well as the main guru of Rabana Kerching is still motivated and hoping to uh, disseminate Rabana Kerching to other, to the next generation. The strong support from Rabana Kerching Association of Kampung Laut and the, neighbor, the neighborhood, a passion and love of the people who are involved in Rabana Kerching is very, very important and endless support from 
all interested parties is very important too. Next. These are the pictures. The humble building of Rabana Kerching in 2014. Next. These are the recognitions that re they received as of 2014. Next. And Pak Harun starting the class with the people of Kampung Laut. Next. This is what I say the vest. That is the motif of butterfly, if I'm not mistaken. Next. And this is also another motif, which is the dragon motif. Yeah, embroidered on the vest. Next. Next. These are the dancers starting to perform. Yeah, young girls, less than 12 years old. Next, below than 12 years old. They start to perform. There's, it's a simple dance. Next. Yeah, there's, uh, this is one of the position. Squatting. Next. Okay, next. Okay, they perform like in in um, intertwining with each other. This is one of the steps. Yeah, sometimes the feet is touching is touching the the, the 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 surface of the floor. Next, and this is the end the end of the show. Bowing to say thank you. Next. Last but not least, I would close with a pantun, a Malay or traditional oral tradition of rhyming words. Rabana Kerching is our game. Rain or shine, it will be in our vein. Want to think of the future flame so as we would not be blamed. Thank you for listening from me, Farouk Zakaria. I'm not from Faculty of Islamic Studies. I am now in Language Centre, Prince of Songkhla University, Patani Campus. Sawadikap. Thank you. Sawadikap, thank you very much, Prof. Faro, for the sharing. Uh, Prof. Faro indeed is the best person of reference for uh, traditional Malay performing arts, especially in the landscape of uh, Klantani's uh, performing arts. Um, um, so thank you very much, Prof. Faro. Uh, surely I will have uh, uh, more questions to toss to you later. Um, so uh, next, uh, for, for, the, for our audience on Facebook Live as well as YouTube Live, uh, don't forget to uh, fill up the attendance form because I think we will uh, provide you with an e-certificate for your participation in this program, uh, in the webinar. Um, uh, also, stay tuned for, the, uh, for those audience in Facebook uh, as well as YouTube live streaming because uh, later on we'll have a quiz session in which you'll get a chance to uh, receive an uh, e-certificate if you answer the questions correctly. So next, I'm going to toss the next question to Prof Chapman. Uh, Prof, in your line of work, uh, so we have been talking just now about uh, preservation uh, heritage. Uh, how, how do you actually uh, define preservation in terms of preserving architectural heritage or archaeological heritage? And are there somehow, are there similarities between this kind of preservation to the preservation of um, performing arts? I think that's a <clears throat> very good question. I think at one point, maybe 40 years ago, people thought it was a purely technical operation to preserve architecture or archaeological sites. But increasingly, I believe people understand that there's a great deal of overlap between the two because of a lot of work is driven by traditional crafts and traditional craftspeople who can, or artisans who are capable of do the, doing these things. So this was pretty evident even in, say, in Cambodia, where you had masons that were able to recarve pieces that were no longer there <coughs> um, or to substitute pieces for damaged um, pieces of stone and to realize that the skill sets were still there. And in fact, at Praia Khan, one of the sites that I was involved with, we actually um, used even very traditional methods of, of um, moving stones using traditional pulley systems and things like that. So all of this relies very much on the, uh, on the continuing practices. And if you don't have these, it's very hard to be able to do 
successful historic preservation projects on buildings or monumental archaeological sites of that kind as well. So that's just one example. If you look at um, something we would call vernacular architecture, the architecture of everyday people, it's often not um, it's not done from documents with the specifications and plans. It's done very much from the knowledge of practitioners. And quite often they can re replicate what they've done over centuries by simply having someone knowledgeable to do that. A good example in Hawaii is we no longer have any traditional housing. <clears throat> it was all lost about 100 years ago, which was basically grass grass woven houses. But um, the skills are now being resurrected so that people will at least know how to build those as well. So I think the division between tangible and intangible is somewhat artificial. And I think we increasingly know that to be true. Yeah. All right. Uh, th thank you very much, Prof, uh, for the input. Um, perhaps I'll go to uh, Dr. Erin. Uh, so so uh, based from the input from um, uh, Prof, Prof Chetness just now about intangible and tangible heritage preservation. Uh, so I'm trying to uh, formulate a question here. Uh, the same goes from the input from uh, Prof Faro on performing arts, which is uh, somehow intangible. Um, so uh, Dr. Erin, um, so with you being uh, attached to the uh, Cultural Heritage Center, uh, the Department of States, um, based on your experience or, or your observation, uh, how, how do you see the difference uh, in the preservation of these two types of heritage, tangible and intangible, in a sense that the unique challenges that they possess, in a sense that in the, is the preservation of intangible heritage more challenging than tangible heritage or vice versa? Thank you. Oh, that is a trick question <laughs> because they, I think they both have challenges. Um, uh, in, in different ways, uh, right? Yeah. Because um, with tangible uh, cultural heritage, your challenges um, might be things like climate change leading to uh, flooding that's threatening a collection of objects or that's uh, threatening a heritage site. Um, but that same climate change can also threaten your intangible heritage um, traditions that are related to that to those sites or to those collections. Um, perhaps it was a collection of uh, cooking uh, implements and due to climate change, the ingredients that would be used in those traditional dishes don't grow or don't live in the same places that they used to. You used to be able to find them in this meadow and now you can't. Um, so I, I think in some ways, uh, the challenge, the larger challenges um, can be very similar between between the two, um, but on a smaller scale, it's it's of course a very different thing to um, rebuild a, a crumbling stone step or an archway than it is to preserve, um, you know, a, a way of speaking or a dialect or a language. So um, so it they all take ingenuity and they all need to be driven by the community and culture that value those things. So I think maybe there's there's both commonalities and differences. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Harry. Um, um, let, let us focus a bit on uh, Rubana Kerching, uh, Prof. Faro. Uh, just now you have been uh, talking about uh, Rubana Kerching, the current situation and uh, reviving Rubana Kerching, yes. which can, can happen or might not happen. And somehow mm. you mentioned about um, uh, about uh, Ma'yong, which is uh, uh, there is a somehow a successful uh, revival of Ma'yong. Uh, yeah. How can Urbana Kerching learn from Ma'yong, if you can explain in detail? All right. Now um, I'm involved in the Ma'yong performances, mm -hmm. and I've I've seen how Ma'yong has been revived uh, by by migrating from from the original state which is Kelantan to uh, Kuala Lumpur now it became very popular then even now um, because it has been a, a curriculum in the university it was introduced in the university as a curriculum 
So it was being introduced in Aswara or Akademi Seni Kebangsaan, which is a which is taking Mayung as a subject. So as a result, the students propagate the performance of Mayung, and people see Mayung there quite frequently. And as a result, people understand and appreciate it. Now, with regards to Rabana Kerching, we have been presenting or performing it in in just Kampung Laut or in on or in some occasions in Kelantan. So that's why Rabana Kerching is not expanding because it is just limited to that area. Whereas in Mayung, it became a national, it is brought up to national level. And Mayung has got the UNESCO, uh, some funding from UNESCO and is being recognized by UNESCO as one of the traditional performances in Kelantan as well as in Malaysia. So I think that brought Mak Yong to a higher level compared to other kind of performances. So that's why Mak Yong still survives. And currently it's not being performed only by Kelantanese. It is also being, being taken. The skills of performing is being taken by people, the whole uh, Malaysia. I mean, those uh, performance, performers are now from Kuala Lumpur, from other states apart from Kelantan. Even the musical instrument is being played by those people who are not Kelantanis anymore. So the um, the dissemination of knowledge and skills of Mayo has uh, gone from Kelantan to other states of uh, Malaysia. And that's how it survived. Whereas Rebanya Kerching is still in the state of Kelantan and in Kampung Laut alone. And I think we have to start uh, making it more um, visible to other people in Malaysia. That's my, my view. And as usual in Malaysia, um, tangible heritage is not being well understood by the people. Yeah? So um, that's why people couldn't see that, well, uh, food, um, costumes are not, really, are not really something that they have to be worried of. You know? For example, now you can see people, are, women are wearing more Arabs kind of outfit compared to our own baju kurung and baju kebaya because we do not have that kind of awareness, the loyalty or the sense of belonging to our own heritage. So that's my, my personal view on all this. Ma Yong survived because it was, brought to, it was brought into a university as a curriculum as well as it's being taught to other people, not just Kelantanese. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Faro, for the uh, insight. Um, yes. Yeah, so it is. Uh, it is crucial for uh, those people involved in preserving uh, Rabana Kerching to take note of the success stories of uh, other performing arts who have gone through the phase of uh, declining and then they managed to be uh, sustained. Oh. Um, of course, based from the points mentioned from uh, Prof. Faro just now, it could be a long way to go for Ravana Kraching, but as long as we understand what what to do, uh, we should be on the right track. So thank you very much, Prof. Um, um, uh, next, next we'll have, um, we will have a short break for of a few minutes um, in which we will have a, a brief quiz se session for our audience on Facebook and YouTube uh, live streaming. So, um, we are going to take just a short break for, for a few minutes before we, we proceed with the, with the next part of the webinar. And there are three questions altogether based on the discussion in the webinar just now. I will read out the questions. They are simple questions, not that difficult. Um, and you may write the answers, those uh, audience, uh, students and the audience in the Facebook Live and YouTube Live. You may write the answers in the comment section of the Facebook Live. And winners will receive an e-certificate. So you may fill up the Google form provided uh, with your names and your details. So we can email you the e-certificate. Um, the first question is, name the three panelists of the webinar today. So you can also see the question on the screen. The second question is, state the place of origin of Rabana Kerching in Clanton.
And the third question is, state another example of a traditional performing art in Kelantan. I will repeat those questions again. In the meantime, you can write the answers in the comment section of Facebook Live. Uh, the first question being, name the three panelists of the webinar today. The second question state the place of origin of Rabana Kuching in Kelantan. And number three, state another example of a traditional performing art in Kelantan. So I'll give um, a couple of minutes for you to respond. Right, so we have uh, some answers already. Um, so let us see some of the answers given. Um, so it's from Colin. It is uh, the answer from number two is Kampung Laut. Uh, yes, that is correct. Uh, is there any other answers that we have? from Noor uh, for question one is Dr. Farouk Zakaria and uh, Dr. Erin Lecky and Prof. William Ryan Chapman. Yeah, so those are correct answers though the spelling are not that uh, accurate. Uh, is there any more answers from Facebook Live? So for those who have um, who have the correct answers for all the three questions, um, um, 
you will receive an e-certificate from uh, the secretariat of the, uh, the the committee of the program today uh, and you will be contacted by them uh, please fill up the google form provided so uh, you can be contacted and the uh, e-certificate can be emailed to you so uh, shall we proceed with uh, the next part of the webinar um so let us continue um so i guess this webinar wouldn't serve its purpose if we do not talk about uh, the best way to preservation and that is what the webinar is aimed for the best practice to preserve heritage so the first question or the next question uh prof chapman as um, before that umk so we are live streaming from UMK, and UMK is a, is a uh, higher education institution. We have thousands of students. We even have the Faculty of Heritage here in UMK with uh, students studying heritage as well as arts. So Prof Chapman, as a, a dean, as a professor teaching college students uh, from Faculty of Architecture, uh, what would be or has been your approach in getting your students to appreciate uh, preservation or value a heritage. So I did see on your profile though at a university website that says that your approach is to have students to learn by doing. So um, uh, perhaps you could answer the question, how do you get your students to uh, appreciate preservation or to preserve or to value a heritage? Thank you. Thank you. I think many times they are actually sort of self-selecting. They come into the courses because they have an interest already <clears throat> and then they go out and then and, and you know i'm not teaching courses in dance or or music or anything like that but i'm teaching people to better appreciate everyday architecture and to appreciate architecture uh, stylistic and so i would think actually it's kind of driven by students there's a great deal of interest by students of architectural preservation now in the architecture of the modern era i know that's true in malaysia and indonesia as well and and in Thailand to some degree where people are so they kind of bring these interests with them but I kind of wanted to if I can make a comment more on best practices for preservation of dance and I've had some sort of some exposure to this and one is when I was first in Cambodia there was a great effort to restore traditional Cambodian dance performance and there were very few instructors that still knew how to do this and usually to be a decent dancer a traditional dancer you have to begin at a very young age and in fact the university of fine arts had a second division that was really had um sort of preschool children in the university learning how to do traditional dance now in the end this would provide dancers that could perform through university programs through Sort of formal national programs they would take it on the road but it also spawned a great deal of sort of semi-commercial um dance and so this is kind of an awkward overlapping area um, at what point does the, the commercialization which might help ensure preservation does that take away from the performance itself um i think we probably find this a great deal in thailand where hotels have performance that seem on the verge of being more theatrical than real you certainly have this example with the kachek in bali which was in many ways assembled by um, outsiders who brought traditional dance into a context of more of entertainment and to tell you the truth a lot of the cambodian dance that we think of as very traditional is really a product of a 1960s revival in the kind of involvement of elites, including uh, um, um, the queen at the time, who was um, Sian Nook himself, were very concerned about bringing back dance. And they kind of created certain dances that were never really part of any traditional repertoire. Now, those are the negative stories. In Hawaii, it's been quite different. We actually had a complete commercialization of Hawaiian dance in the middle part of the 20th century through hotel shows through other things but all through this time you had traditional practitioners still in the background um kumu hula as they're called the teachers forming small clubs and with the 
revival of interest in traditional Hawaiian things generally, language, um, um, culture, practices, and beginning in the 1970s, you found a, a sort of blossoming of hula halau or hula troops that were um, brought into competition. These at first were again spawned by tourism, but ultimately taken over now really by people themselves. So if you were to go to the Merry Monarch Festival in Hilo once a year, it's a great showing of different practices of hula performance. Um, and so in this case, you saw something commercialized um, becoming something really that's um, embraced by everyday people. So I think there are a lot of lessons to learn from the Hawaii situation, Thailand, Cambodia, and, uh, and Bali again, um, what constitutes authenticity, what constitutes um, um, preservation. So I'll just kind of throw that out maybe to even more knowledgeable people like Dr. Farouk, who knows more about this than I do by far. <laughs> All right. Um, th thank you very much, uh, Prof. Chapman. Uh, I think uh, in you and Kate, we could relate to one of the points that you mentioned as well in the, in the beginning just now, that you see the uh, people who are already have the interest in in that uh, in that heritage in that performing art. So uh, those are the people that should be uh, recruited in preserving the performing art itself. And I think we did realize that when we did the uh, training session to uh, train uh, the UNK students, uh, Ravana Kuching, and we, we somehow, so some of the members of the instructors, we, they realized that uh, it is indeed important to look for those who are really interested to participate, uh, to make the, the task easier. Um, um, I'll, I'll drive next question to Dr. Erin. Um, uh, Dr. Erin, um, um, I'm trying to think of the question here. Um, so with you working at the Cultural Heritage Center, uh, Department of State, uh, have you observed any successful preservation project? Well, successful as I may say in the sense that the cultural heritage is able to be retained. And how does that happen? Oh, um... I guess the short answer is yes. <laughs> I've, seen, I've been fortunate to see uh, many very successful projects. Um, but I will say that su what success looks like is, uh, is often very different from, from one community to the next. Um, uh, and that's part because every community's goals for uh, what it wants uh, for its culture going forward are, are going to be a little bit different. For some communities, success means that everybody in the world can hear their stories and see performances um, and they're sharing it very, very broadly and that there is maybe even uh, international trade in uh, recordings of performances, for example, so that there's an economic aspect that feeds back into the practice and helps to support it. So um, th there have been several projects that have used that model. For, for other communities, what success looks like is, is keeping uh, the rest of the world out. <laughs> it's, it's about preserving the traditions of the community just for the community itself. And so it's about controlling access to who gets that information, who gets to hear those stories. Those are very private um, uh, and sacred cultural treasures. And so it, it's absolutely inappropriate uh, to come in and, and blast them out to the rest of the world. Um, so uh, in the examples I tried to use uh, in, in my talk, um, I was looking at, you know, obviously ways that we combine preservation of both tangible and intangible. And I would say that that's, uh, that's often uh, one of the things that makes a project a success, that you, you have to consider not just the practice, but also uh, the environment and, and, and what's threatening the heritage, both the, the objects that make that heritage important and also um, things that could lead to young people not being interested 
or uh, or the the season shifting so that when you would traditionally have performed it is not appropriate to when you would perform it now based on when when the rainy season starts, for example. So uh, I think uh, a, a conversation with the community that is interested in preserving the culture uh, is the most important first step in, in any uh, preservation project. All right, thank you. So that is indeed an interesting point when you say that uh, try to keep the outsiders out um, in order to preserve their heritage. And I'm trying to relate that to the point, one of the points that Prof Farouk mentioned just now, that Rabana Kriching has to be, I mean, it has to be improvised. And that is some of the questions asked in the in the Facebook Live as well by Ms. Linira. So uh, just now Prof mentioned that one of the strategies to uh, uplift Rabana Kriching is to make it more interesting in terms of the costume. So perhaps Prof can add more to that on uh, how to preserve Rabana Kriching. But how do you see uh, the, the, contradic uh, the, the contradicting opinions uh, between those people in Rubana Kriching or in performing arts in general who says that the performing arts should be retained as it is, uh, the originality has to be preserved. And some people would say that it has to be improvised. So how do we find a common ground between these two contradicting opinions? Yeah, thank you very much. I think that is a very good question. This is the problem that we are facing. This is the problem that we're facing among our traditional performances. So. The traditional performers, they say, well, don't touch us. We want to do it our way, all right? But on the other side, the younger generation are not interested because it's too, it's too uh, limited to what they are doing. So, so you have to balance up between these two. For example, now Rabana Kerching. Let us talk about Rabana Kerching or Ma Yong instead. Ma Yong to be very, used to be very local, used to be very local, uh with a costume which is not very appealing or with uh, a script which is too local that people do not understand so when they brought it out to kuala lumpur and become one of the curriculum in the university they change not that they change they they improvise by having good costumes by having uh lyrics or 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 um uh, something that is understandable by the common people and that's how people understand ah this is a very good classical theater when people start to understand that people start to uh to appreciate that ah it's so beautiful you know same goes to our rabana critic if you want to keep in the village and not wanting anyone else to come in and disturb you then it will stay in the village for sure it will not go out and people come and see they don't understand they could when they don't understand they couldn't appreciate when they couldn't appreciate nothing goes beyond there which pe which means that the, the story of rabana kachik is only there but it wouldn't disperse out to other places now look at the indonesian uh dance the bali dance uh in bali well it's being commercialized where pe when when tourists come to bali they say let's go and see this dance uh, the kecak dance, whatever dance they have in Bali. And it is being commercialized, it's being promoted to the rest of the world. And that's make an attraction to Bali. Now, if we keep, um, I agree with Erin that some, some sort of specialty, some sort of exclusivity is for them, right? But, stand, but then you also need to think there, in that place, are there the next generation going to, to inherit it. If that is all the young are going out and not doing anything on that particular performing arts, it will surely die, it will surely die. Um, but if it is being propagated to the younger generation there, and the younger generation there is also interested, then it's okay if you do not want to improvise. But surely when you talk about audience, when you talk about customers nowadays, they want something which is very pleasant, very beautiful, very nice to hear, very, uh, un, you know, something comprehensible. I think that's the nature of the audience now. And we also need to understand the needs of the audience. So I think we are in between um, making it more commercialized and making it more localized. 
localized in a way that we still preserve what we have but giving a new touch a new touch like new coffee nice costumes nice material for the costumes young people playing or young people performing rather than very old people which is not to say that old people are not attractive but I think that is appeal sorry to say that that is appealing to to the to the audience I think that is that is that what makes us a performance become more um more susceptible to changes okay thank you very much thank you very much prof Farrell. so that would have answered both questions in the comment section from Ms. Linira and Dr. Hanisa, I guess. Um, um, I sure do have more questions to ask, but time is limiting. But uh, we, we are going to open for a Q&A session in which the audience will post the questions in the Facebook and YouTube live streaming. But before that, in one minute or less, what would be your advice to the team of the preservation of Rabana Kaching of Kampung Laut? from UMK. What would be your advice? Maybe, maybe we can start with Prof. Arofes in one minute or less. Okay. Um, I've seen all of you have been working very hard and I would con congratulate you for all the effort that you have done. I would like to congratulate UMK as well as the US Embassy for taking this task, which is not an easy task. And I guess from now on, UMK should lead the training in performing uh, Rabana Kerching in the society to schools LOS, as well as to universities because i think this is how uh, we can disseminate the skills and the knowledge of urban coaching and umk has got to ensure that this thing is continued not just stop after the research finish then it is just being um, put under the desk no it has got to be continued I mean, the effort has got to be continued and has got to be sustainable. If it is not sustainable, then the research has got no impact. So I think UMK has got to play an important role as the lead for a sustaining uh, Rabana Kerching in Malaysia or, in fact, bringing it to the, bringing it to the world. I've seen this in, the, uh, in uh, what is that, in uh, DK Barat, yeah? where the the art of dk barat is has been disseminated to all even to the world in united states they know how to play dk barat in europe they know how to play dk barat the wow bulan song ewa bule, ewa bule, ewa bule, it's is there at in the United States, in Canada, in Europe? So let's do it. I think UMK has got to take the lead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Faro. Dr. Erin, what about you? What is your advice? Well, I really uh, try not to give advice to teams that are oh, already okay. doing so well. <laughs> um, but maybe if I could make a general comment, um, and that's to say, if we want to get young people involved, that we have to give them agency. We have to trust them with the knowledge to make it uh, not necessarily something different, but something that has meaning for them in, in their lives and not just tell them you must do it in the same way that it's always been done. Um, so this is maybe echoing what Professor uh, Farouk said as well. All right. Thank you very much, Prof. Chapman, your comment or advice. Uh, I'm going to return to this idea of the uh, Merry Monarch Festival in Hawaii, um, which began as a kind of modest tourism effort, a kind of competition among troops that then grew into popularity. And maybe that's a way you develop popularity if you can, to some degree, subsidize teachers to be able to pass this on to create a network of of practitioners, mainly young kids that go into this, so that it becomes a kind of rite of passage for school children so that they learn it in school and then they, they do begin to embrace it as part of their culture. I think these are ways you can build upon that, but I think um, I'm kind of agreeing with Aaron and, and Dr. Farouk. You, you really have to make it something that people want to do. You can't make it something that they resist or feel that they're 
um, having to do because it's good for you and culture is good for you. You've got to bring some element of enjoyment and fun and pride and pleasure into it for the different practitioners. So again, I think I, Aaron, we probably saw this happen in the United States. They got um, girls soccer going by simply promoting it. And now it's an integral part of our culture. You'd think it was an ancient part of our culture, girls' soccer. <laughs> but anyone in the United States knows that, if, especially if you're a father of two girls, as I was, that that's a big part of what you do as a, as a mom. And we even have the saying, soccer mom, because of this. So again, it was introduced through institutions fighting to make this happen. And, I think there could be presumably an element of competitiveness involved in the different troops as well, whether it's in the beauty of their costumes, which is certainly something that the Hawaiian um, hula halau, you saw on that one slide adopt, they put a great deal of time into their costumes and then also into their dance. And some, some perform dances that have a somewhat um, newer slant on traditional dance. Others are very strictly traditional. They even have two sessions of kind of strictly traditional and then more inventive, newer traditions. So those are things I think that would really keep it vital. I don't think it can simply be an academic effort. It has to be taken out into the community. <clears throat> All right. Uh... Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Chapman. We are going to have, uh, we are going to allow the audience from Facebook Live and YouTube Live to throw some questions to the panels today. So feel free to write, put your questions in the comment section. You can also uh, notify to whom the question is asked, which panel, or I can just throw the questions to, to the panels. So uh, we are waiting for the questions from Facebook Live. Any questions that you would like to ask? We have a few minutes for that before uh, we end the session. Any questions from the audience? Um, we have... Um, one question from Dr. Hanisa. Um, so I guess that question has somehow been answered by Prof. Faro just now, talking about the costume, um, whether the, the, the contradicting of opinions uh, within to retain the originality of the custom or to improvise. Um, any more question? Well, well, based on what um, what Hanisa was asking just now, Dr. Hanisa was asking, I think it's true we have to keep it as traditional as possible, but, but then, of course, it has got to be a little improvised, not to change, not to change all. I mean, based on the old costumes, we make it better in terms of its material use, in terms of its feature and things like that. Yeah. Still, the traditional is being maintained. Yep. Um, any questions? Uh, yes, we, we are already in the Q&A session. Um, we are already in the Q&A session, so... Uh, feel free to drop your questions in the comment section. We have a few more minutes for that. Um, yeah, from uh, Ms. Linera. Um, do you think that one of the ways of preserving this tangible art by Turbana coaching is to maybe improvise it? Also, the same questions that have been posed just now or modernizing it in order to attract the younger generations. Uh, if Prof. Farouk has more uh, opinion on that, I think that has been answered as well just now. Yeah, I think modernizing in a way that you still keep the traditional 
element. Modernizing, but understanding the traditional elements, not just modernizing for the sake of modernizing. If the costume use is, for example, if the costume use is like that, with a vest and with a flap at the back, well, keep it like that, but you cannot change it into another costume because the originality of Rabana Kerching is like that. So you cannot change it into like wearing kabaya or wearing the la or wearing whatever. It's like that. So you change the material use. Perhaps now they use um, satin, um, satin polyester, but then we change it into more traditional like songket or like uh, kain tenun, uh, local weaving, weaved uh, material, something like that. That is what I think. Yeah. Uh, there is uh, one more question from Karnit Sripawaraya. I'm not sure this question is directed to which panel. Um, uh, dear Prof, regarding the preservation tradition, could you share your perspective about globalized tradition and what is the point that we should concern? Thanks. Uh, who would answer the question? Uh, is it Prof Faro again or the other two panels? Let's, let's hear to our professors yeah. from America. Yeah. What about uh, Prof Chapman? Well, I think we've touched upon this a number of times. We want to keep, I think Aaron said it the most eloquently, do you want to keep it your own or do you want to have it go out? And I think that's that's really an, an important decision you have to make. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be all or nothing. I mean, there are troops in Cambodia that through the fine arts department that perform very traditionally and then others that go on on, the, on basically on the road and perform in, in around the world and they modify the dances somewhat for an international audience. I remember the first Thai performance I saw was struck me as very slick and very commercial because it was at the Oriental Hotel and it was quite different from what I had been experiencing in Cambodia where there was still a sense of connection to the society. So. I, I think it doesn't have to be all or nothing. And I think, but in some cases, it will have to be all or nothing. There are certain kinds of performances that are never meant to be broadcast beyond the community and others that can be. All right, thank you, Prof Chapman. I'm going to direct the next question to Dr. Aaron Lecky. Uh, can Rabana Kaching, or maybe you just uh, generalize it as performing arts, attract youngsters compared to social media, how to make them willing to spend time learning performing arts than surfing the social media? Well, I feel like that that is an excellent question and one that um, we get asked a lot uh, as the Cultural Heritage Center and one that as a mother myself, I think about a lot, how the heck do you get kids to put their phone down and do anything else, uh, much less the thing that you actually uh, want them to do, the thing, thing that would benefit uh, the culture. And so I will say maybe that there, um, there are ways to integrate the two. So we have, um, we have sponsored a lot of projects um, through um, what we call game jams, where, um, where we use uh, app developers or game developers, um, a whole contest for them to develop games that um, actually teach aspects of either language or uh, or other cultural traditions, or um, sometimes they teach stories, um, and so so those two things don't have to uh, to be a hundred percent separate. But um, I, I guess I, then I would just I'll also refer to my previous answer that if we want kids to be involved, it has to feel like it's theirs, um, because if they're mm -hmm. just learning out of obligation to their family they they might do it but they won't they won't love it they won't it won't become their own and that's what you need to have it go forward so how do you ensure that they do love it and it does become their own um that that's the trick but i think one way is to give them a, a degree of 
of agency to to adapt it to the situation, to, to make the stories, the universal stories that are being told through the, the tradition reflect their lives in their times. So, um, so letting them, them make it their own. Thank you, Dr. Erin, for the answer. Um, an important point to note, uh, especially for the landscape of performing arts in Malaysia, uh, something that is not that obvious of what you mentioned just now. One last question to Prof Chapman. Earlier, you have shared how the intangible aspects of traditional dance in Hawaii has been preserved. Could this be applied in Rabana Kuching? Uh, I think I've tried to answer that already. Yeah, um, I think so. <laughs> I suggested that there are ways that perhaps yeah. that could be looked into. One of the things that does drive the Hawaii interest is there's some level of competition among the troops. It's almost like carnival in Brazil that way. And so they're very committed to the annual performance and they want to come in, do the best job of anyone. And they, they rank them and they give out prizes and things. So maybe that is a possibility but again i'm new to understanding urbana coaching and i don't know what whether it adapts itself to something like that or not but i think dr farouk would know better than me <laughs> all right thank you prof chapman earlier you have uh, given a longer explanation on that to answer that question uh, basically, uh, that would be the last question that we received and we are running behind time already and that would be the end of the webinar. Thanks to all the panelists. We are going to have a photography session now, so uh, it is appreciated if all of us on StreamYard could look at the camera so we can snap some photos on the count of three. One, two, three. One more. One, two, three. All right, done. Um, before that, uh, before we end with the event today, let us all watch a video performance of Rabana Coaching. And this video is prepared by the documentary cluster of the preservation of the Rabana Coaching of Kampung Laut project which is led by Mr. Fadlan from the Faculty of Creative Arts and Heritage, UMK. It's a
ini terus memainkan peran masing-masing dalam memastikan hal ini berlaku dengan jayanya. UMK dengan kerjasama kedutaan besar Amerika Syarikat di Kuala Lumpur akan bersama-sama dalam menghidupkan kembali seni persembahan berbanda kecil dan akan membawa seni persembahan ini dengan lebih jauh agar lebih dikenali dan boleh dihargai di hargai di serata dunia. So, in that respect, the project Rabana Kepcing is an excellent opportunity to, to uh, make these connections. The people that are working on the project, led by Professor and Mr. Harun, and all of the other people involved, including the young people, this will create connections between America and Kalanta. We want to be involved in the project. We want to see it progress. We want to come back in about one year when it's a uh, year in completion to see the progress. We understand there's going to be a documentary that all of Malaysians can see on TV1. So this will be a wonderful example of cooperation between America and Malaysia, specifically Embassy Kuala Lumpur and Selangkan. <laughs> for the video um, so uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, the panels uh, the, uh, the the members of the audience from facebook live streaming so uh, the webinar has now come to an end and on behalf of the committee i would like to extend our utmost appreciation to our panelists prof chapman dr erin daiki prof Faro, and I would also like to take this opportunity to extend our appreciation to individuals who have been involved in making this webinar a success, uh, Dr. Nur, uh, Dr. Ng and the team. And it is also hoped that with the ideas discussed, uh, we learn something new on preservation and preserving the heritage, um, uh, not just limited to urban coaching, uh, to ensure that they can be sustained as a sense of identity for the current and future generation. So uh, thank you very much to our panels. I hope we can meet again in the future. Maybe we'll have uh, another webinar in the future to talk about the same topic or different topic. So thank you very much, uh, Prof Chapman, uh, Dr. Erin, Prof Faro, for uh, your willingness to be with us today. Thank you. All right. So uh, we may leave the we may leave stream yet now.